Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Amy Glass, and I am a, uh, the Information Services Librarian at Illinois Central College. I am also the coordinator of the college's One Book, One College program. Um, the One Book, One College program is a year-long interdisciplinary program engaging the ICC community through the reading and discussion of a shared book. And our selection for 2021-2022 was the book One of Us is Lying by Karen McManus. Um, it is a mist murder mystery set in a high school. Um, basically, if you're familiar with the movie The Breakfast Club, add a murder mystery to that and you've got the, the movie right there. Uh, you've got the book right there. It was also made into a limited Peacock series if you've got the Peacock streaming service. And um, at this point, I think I am going to turn this over to Taylor, who is an intern here at ICC, and she's going to introduce our panelists. Hi, everyone. As she said, yeah, I'm an intern here in the Counseling Center at ICC. Um, I'm in the last year of my master's degree in clinical mental health counseling over at Bradley. So yeah, I'm going to be your guys moderator today. I've got some questions and stuff like that. But before we get started with questions, um, if the other panelists want to like give a brief introduction, we can start with that. So whoever wants to go first, feel free. Hi, everyone. I'm Tom Payne Brewer. I am one of the counselors at Illinois Central College. Uh, my name is uh, Seth Arian. I'm a counselor with the foster care division of uh, Children's Home. Hi, everyone. I'm Deborah Montgomery Kuhn. I am the director of the Counseling Center here at Bradley University. Hi, my name is Brooke Poling. I am a counselor at, a, uh, at Life Science Health in Peoria, which is a national organization as well. And used to work for Deborah when I was an intern. So hi, Deborah. <laughs> That's okay. I used to work at foster care at Children's Home. So hi, Seth. <laughs> okay. So um, before we get started, does it, does anybody have any questions for the panelists before I get into the ones that I've prepared for everyone? I'll just interject here that if people want to do this through the chat, I'd be more than willing to do that. Um, I'll, I can monitor the chat for that. And also just the, the theme of one of these books, of this book, there's a strong mental health theme throughout this book. So that's why we decided to come up with this panel here today. Okay, so nobody has any, you know, pressing questions that they'd like to start with. Um, the first one I have is, uh, this event is called, um, All of Us Are Faking It Until You Make It. So um, how can faking it until you make it be helpful in dealing with difficult situations? So everybody, you know, feel free to add your opinion. And then obviously we have the more than qualified mental health panel to answer as well. <laughs> Okay, I can start. Um, so, so definitely faking until you make it. Um, what what comes to mind immediately for me when we're talking about that in difficult situations is maybe those situations where we are very anxious about something that's coming on um, and, and have that big feeling of anxiety that's really preventing us from doing something that um, that we need to do. Um, I, I know working with college students a lot, a lot of the times that's homework and that, you know, I'm behind on homework and it's piling up and it's become this thing that's scary. And sometimes that idea of faking it to make it, um, you know, what would it be like to act like you are not behind it? You've got it together. Are you going to work on your homework a little easier if you're doing it like that? Um, you know, it's like going it to seem less scary to approach that. That's just something that comes to mind for me right away, thinking about that theme. Yeah, kind of to build off of that, um, 
I know I felt, uh, I know the phrase faking it until you make it was something that was very common when I started my work as a counselor. Um, that kind of imposter syndrome is what I think of when I think about um, faking it until you make it, where the answer is you have that in you the entire time. You have that ability. Um, it's just getting over that anxiety like uh, Tom uh, was mentioning there. So, um, you know, it, it is faking it till you make it, but you've, you've got that in you the, the whole time. It's just a matter of getting, getting over that anxiety. Yeah, I also, I think about um, things like, let's say social anxiety or just, you know, different situations, maybe presenting in front of a class where um, a lot of times that biggest hurdle is starting or doing it the first time. And then after that, a lot of, I hear a lot of people say, and myself included, oh, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. And so that aspect of faking it until you make it is a lot of times to me, that beginning hurdle, whether it be, um, you know, like Tom said, starting on uh, homework or giving a presentation in front of the class, going to a club that um, maybe you wouldn't, that you're not feeling confident in being social in that way or um, trying out for something, uh, anything like that. I think faking it until you make it is a, a useful tactic because you're never going to get to experience that uh, feeling of kind of, oh, I can do this until you actually do it. I actually I had a couple. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Pam. I had a couple of thoughts. Um, it just really shows how powerful the mind is and how our mind can be sometimes our worst enemy and just some of those negative thoughts. And so sometimes it's just replacing those, you know, a negative thought with a positive thought that could help you also just take one, even just very small step forward, you know, and sometimes that's all you can do, maybe just sort of move forward 1%, um, but that's at least progress and a success. And it really then will show the person that, you know, I, I can do this. And sometimes it is two steps forward, one step back. But again, I think just, you know, going forward and trying to, you know, um, like I said, sort of replace some of those negative thoughts with a positive thought. I was just going to say, you can <clears throat> also approach it from kind of the opposite perspective in the sense of, you know, think of whatever that worst case scenario is. And if you can handle whatever the worst case scenario is, so if the worst thing that happens, but you could still handle it, that takes that fear piece out of whatever it is you're trying to do. And so that makes it much more doable. Seems like you can, you know, fake it till you make it. It gives you that, you know, ability to see that, oh, I could even handle the worst thing that could possibly ha happen. So it's less likely that that's going to happen. So I can handle whatever does happen then. I wanted to add something else to that too, is that uh, we need to normalize that making mistakes is okay too. This whole idea of faking it till you make it is kind of this, uh, well, I can't make a mistake along the way. So I'm just going to hope that I can fake it until I know what I'm doing. Um, life is full of mistakes. No person is, uh, you know, perfect. And so um, being okay with saying I made a mistake and asking someone else, how do I fix this? How do I make it better for next time? I'm going old school on raising my hand. Um, this is Michelle. Um, to all the counselors, thank you for everything you do. We we appreciate you and you are needed in all of our lives. Um, to what Deborah and Seth had said, I totally agree. Um, you know, I know, you know, I'm a fairly new dean here and I often have to say like, what's the worst thing that can happen? Um, I told my husband the other day, I was all worked up about something and I was like, gosh, I'm not an ER doctor, like no one's gonna die. Um, I know that's a little extreme, but I was in kind of a panic attack. I'm like, okay, it's gonna be fine. Um, to what Seth um, said, you know, it's so true. What helps me is, um, you know, we have a Dean's Council here and, um, you know, I see, 
you know, even the veteran deans making mistakes and it's okay. And um, I've learned that like, they don't know it all either. Sorry, I'm looking at what other deans are on here. Sorry, I busted you guys out, but you guys don't know it all either. Um, you know, and that it's, it's okay to reach out like my worst, probably my weakest area is budget. So it's okay when budget time comes around to reach out to my favorite budget gal, Amy. Um, that's a smart thing for me to do, to say I'm weak in budget, go to Amy, she's the budget expert and have her help me, you know, in my weak areas. I'm not going to be an expert in everything. And so I'm not going to fake being a budget expert. I'm going to go to the budget expert. And so I'm kind of learning that it's okay not I'm giving my per, myself permission not to be perfect in all the areas, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And and again, thank you to the counselors, the work that you do. Um I used to be in law enforcement. Um the work that you do um for everybody in our community is amazing. So I can't thank you enough. Uh, thank you. Sorry, guys, I got kicked out like it was frozen. I was kicked out for a second, but it, uh, hopefully we'll smoothly, smoothly from now on. So um, the next question I have for you guys is, um, in this book, an important topic that comes up is um, signs of depression and a lot of the main characters deal with these kind of issues and other people often don't notice these signs of depression in their friends, especially in this book. So um, what are some of the ways you can recognize signs of depression in yourself and in others? So yeah, you guys, or obviously we have lots of counselors that know the signs of depression, but. I'd like to hear from you guys too. Okay, I can go first again. <laughs> um, so, you know, one thing, uh, again, just kind of relating it back and I know just very, very applicable to this conversation where we're having this, um, you know, with a, a college and, and college students, because I know we've got a lot of folks that are either college students or are teaching college students or are in regular contact with college students. So uh, there might be some of those things that we don't necessarily think of right off the bat that could be some signals of depression. Um, a huge one is poor hygiene. You know, if you've got that student that other students are starting to physically distance from because they're showing poor hygiene, that could be um, that could be because of depression. Um, that for you know professors that might be with us today, that might also look like that student that maybe you've had in classes before or from the get go in the class kind of seems to have things together. And all of a sudden, maybe in class is looking more tired, is not completing assignments, is getting way lower grades than they normally would out of nowhere. And, and certainly there's all different kinds of things that could be going on, but um, you know, that's certainly one of the things that could be going on for that student. I see uh, Maya said in the chat that lack of motivation is also a sign of depression, which is true as well. Um, anybody else have ones that they'd like to add? I really think in many ways, major changes in anything, behavior, hygiene, grades, interactions with other people, appetite, any of those huge changes or in, not even necessarily huge, but significant enough to be noticeable changes in yourself or in other people is definitely a key that something's going on, be it depression, be it stress, be it anxiety, be it not functioning to way they normally would. I think those are the, your biggest keys. I saw that uh, Sherry put irritability. That one's also very common. I know that one's also a lot more common in kids as well that shows up as irritability. Um, another one I'd like to add is like 
lack of enjoyment in things that they normally would enjoy. So say you have a friend and you ask them to hang out or go out with you. And if that's something they normally like to do and they, you know, you find them saying no a lot more, that could be a sign as well. Um, and then Brian just said in the chat, um, indecision, indecisiveness. Yes, that's another one. I was gonna mention um, the sleep, sleep, lack of, you know, not being able to sleep with their sleep schedules all over the place. Um, sleeping too much, too little. Um, and I also even noticed just too, just a uh, lack of responding. You know, you're reaching out, emailing, and I know college students aren't the best sometimes with emailing back, but you know, if you have repeated kind of ways to try to contact them, they're just sort of shutting down, maybe withdrawing that whole withdrawal um, and not, you know, uh, when, especially when you're trying to offer help and they're not responding, so. Yeah, yeah, those are all good. Some uh, in the chat, somebody else said um, being indecisive um, and not being able to concentrate, and also um, social isolation is another big one. Yeah, those are all important things to look out for um, in yourself and others um, that may be dealing with depression. So, um, if you guys are comfortable moving on, the next question is uh, one of the major themes in. The book we're discussing, One of Us is Lying, um, is how gossip can negatively impact everyone involved and can create a lot of stress um, for those who are affected by the gossip. No, so no, um, no, 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 no. what are some of your guys' tips that you might have for people that are being affected by gossip? Oh, what is this? Uh, Maya added to the chat that you can talk to someone that you trust. Anyone else have any ideas? I would just say if, if they want and where they feel they can, if they can try to correct misinformation to the people that they find most important in their life, where they can, if, they, if they're able to do that. I know that's hard, um, but I think that's one step that they can do to try to take back some power and control in their life when these social media bursts go crazy that, like they do. Um, so they try to can try to correct some misinformation to those people that they care most about. And the only other thing that they really can do is try to find ways to let go of the rest of it that they can't control. I think another thing that um, is a little bit less direct, but just being mindful of, um, I guess, the relationships that you have. And I think gossip is a really simple way to build relationships, but they're not deep. They're not really meaningful. A lot of times you might know you have that person that you always complain about other people with. And just knowing that most likely if that, that person's kind of relationship with you that probably they're not a safe person to share certain things with, or they may be more likely to do that with others. And I think just trying to be mindful about your own um, engagement in gossip and, you know, assuming things versus, um, you know, giving people the benefit of the doubt or um, that kind of thing. I think it can be really easy. I know for myself, it's very easy to sometimes get caught up um, when other people are talking and just be like, oh yeah, that, that must be true. But trying to reel people back sometimes and be mindful about, you know, we don't really know what's going on in this situation. Let's not make um, some major assumptions here. Yeah, I think that's all good advice. A couple people in the chat talked about, you know, cutting off negative people in your life, you know, maybe those people that, that you only talk to, to gossip about others. Um, and also, you know, someone also said knowing your truth and what's actually true, you know, and keeping that in mind and trying not to let the other stuff bother you. Um, yeah, someone says ignoring it, letting it go, um, and just reassuring yourself that the people that are important in your life, um, make sure they know the truth and they, you know, know your true character and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so, and if, uh, if I can go ahead. jump in as well, real quick, just to build off of as well the 
the idea of control and, you know, letting go of those things that you can't control. You know, I, I think the same thing goes with this gossip piece of how much control does that piece of gossip actually have over your life? And if it is something that's inconsequential and, you know, a lot of gossip ends up being really inconsequential, you know, does, does you expending that energy on addressing it really end up addressing it? Or are you putting yourself in a worse spot because of it? Is something really small, you know, or are you escalating with yourself the way that other people might be escalating it with each other? Yeah, those are all good things to keep in mind. Um, I was so, going to add something else. Ahead. So somebody just, I think maybe Deborah might have mentioned this, but not so much maybe an answer to what you just asked the question, but the whole thing about social media. Um, I mean that, I know there's been so much uh, reports on connection between depression and social media that I think that it does take more of a toll, I think on, um, if we're talking about college students, you know, more than maybe they realize. And sometimes, you know, if they're seeing some of that gossip maybe on social media, um, people are posting things, et cetera, it, it can really put them going down like a spiral. And so sometimes just even talking I, actually, there's a, a student that I actually uh, meet with quite a lot, and you know that has been a big issue for her. So, you know, she has taken some breaks off of social media, and that's really helped her um, depression and anxiety. And so, sometimes, while we know that there's a lot of research out there connecting those, I'm not sure how much college students maybe believe it so that maybe that they see that connection. So maybe sometimes just um, suggesting that to to students or anyone that's struggling with depression, maybe just you know, staying off of it um, to maybe start getting your thoughts together. So, and to start feeling better about yourself. Yeah, I think that's uh, great advice. Um, and yeah, somebody mentioned taking breaks from TikTok and things like that. I mean, and comparison is a huge aspect when it comes to social media. I mean, you see these people that are obviously on social media, you put your best foot forward. So you only see the best parts of those people online and it becomes hard to not compare yourself to those people as well. So yeah, no, all, all good advice. I think um, it's, like you said, Taylor, I think it's really important to remember. And especially I think when people are, are feeling depressed or feeling down about their, themselves, it's very easy to kind of look at other people and and sort of idealize that and think, why can't I be like that? But really remembering like, this is people's highlight reels and what they're choosing to show. I mean, they might have taken this photo, but, and look really happy in it, but you don't know the rest of the story of what was really going on. So I think just reminding yourself that, you know, it's, it's not um, always how it looks. And it doesn't mean that someone else is having, is happy all the time, just because their social media looks that way. Yeah, uh, I, I totally agree. Um, <laughs> so uh, the next question I have for you guys is um, that uh, all of the characters in this book experience stress that comes from both the events um, happening to them and just like daily stresses of life um, that they were already facing before this huge, you know, murder mystery scandal of one of their classmates mysteriously, you know, passing away. Um, so what are some of the things that you can do to help manage work and academic stress as both, you know, students and, you know, faculty? Start on this one. Um, so uh, for me, it's always all about self-care. I think I know, especially when I was uh, in college, um, there's kind of this mindset of I've got to work as hard as possible and I've got to get all my work done before I can do anything fun that I enjoy. And so just taking a moment for that self-care, if you need that uh, break in between, you know, halfway through that paper, take that break um, and take some time for yourself. Um, you know, maybe it's, I don't finish the paper today, I'll finish it tomorrow. And I'm going to go hang out with my friends tonight. Um, you know, obviously, set yourself uh, limits, um, but really take care of yourself, because otherwise, you, the work that you do um, isn't 
going to be your best work. Um, so that self-care is important and that's whatever you enjoy doing. Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, I'm, I'm reading the chat and I'm, I'm reading what Maya and Jordan wrote. And um, I think like Seth said, you know, I, I'm 56 and I'm finally realizing that, um, yeah, don't have to be perfect. Like the house doesn't always have to be clean. The kids don't always have to be perfect. You know, the yard doesn't always have to be mowed. The work doesn't always, like enough. Like it doesn't always have to be that way. So, you know, I can stop sometimes and do some things that are good for my mental and physical health you know, whether it be work out or read a book or, you know, sit on the deck or yeah, drink a glass or two of wine. Um, I'm not going to lie. We're all adults. Um, but, you know, exactly like Seth says, you know, what's the alternative? I just keep go, 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 go. How good is my work product going to be or my mental health or physical health going to be, you know, if I'm doing that with no break or you know no enjoyment it's i'm finally it took me this long to realize there's got to be some kind of a balance um i'm not great at it yet i'm, I'm still working on it um, sometimes my husband will be like michelle it's 10 o'clock at night why are you like organizing the kitchen and i'm like okay yeah i'm going back to that crazy michelle who thinks everything has to be perfect but you know, I work on it every day and, and try to kind of get a little something, something in there for me and, um, you know, stop when I need to stop. And um, I think we kind of all know, right? Like we're in the middle of that email or that paper and we're like, yeah, this isn't, this isn't good. I got to stop. Like if I keep writing this, this email is not going anywhere or this paper is not going anywhere. Like, this draft ain't a good this is gonna have to go in the draft or the safer later pile and and i think we know it so um totally totally agree with you know the the comments and the and the um uh, in the chat so all you guys younger than me don't feel bad um 56 and still figuring it out so give yourselves a break <laughs> and just to bounce off what you were saying michelle i think it's for me, it's like just giving myself permission. I think that's a lot of it. It's like, um, I know it, but it's like, it's okay. You know, I, I, I help the students with a lot of this. So like, I need to be applying it to myself too. But the balance, it's, it's, it's a everyday kind of challenge for sure when that to-do list is pretty long. But I think it just um, comes down to, you know, we know that that's for our health, for our physical, mental, you know, emotional kind of health, that we need to have that balance. And sometimes it's making some really hard decisions so we can um, be healthy and be our best, you know. Um, and sometimes that's just, you know, for me, it's like just making sure I get that good sleep every night. So, and sometimes that's a challenge because I tend to, you know, at, at night, it's like, okay, this is my downtime and then I can stay up too late and then I pay the consequences the next day. So, you know, it's just more of, making good decisions every day really yeah i think all of that is helpful um and yeah just kind of prioritizing and trying to space things out i know for myself i'm i work here at icc as an intern but i'm also still in school so something that i do is i i take tuesdays off for my internship because i have class that night and i know that like i'd be super drained if i was here you know seeing clients all day and then i was at class all night as well. So like even maybe scheduling time in your daily week routine to be like this day, I'm not, I'm not working on schoolwork. I'm not answering emails, whatever it might be. And like, you know, forcing yourself to take some time for yourself and relax and stuff like that can be helpful too. Um, I think the word boundaries just come to mind. Really. It's just setting some really good boundaries and um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a good thing. Yes. Um, so, uh, oh, so, I mean, my next question was about self-care, but I think we covered that. <laughs> um, so, I uh, something I wanted to add, sorry, okay. no, go ahead. But, um, one thing that we, I learned a lot, um, at Bradley actually, and kind of through some of their programs in the counseling center and they had, um, 
another program in the past was kind of this idea of the different areas of wellness. And I think when we're talking about self-care, thinking about those different areas, because um, you may be really good at doing things that are like physical self-care, like working out or eating well, but maybe you're really struggling with, um, maybe you're not uh, doing any sort of self-care in terms of, you know, emotional health or financial. Maybe you're, you know, spending all your money and then you're stressed out about it all the time. I'm sure financial is definitely a tough one for college students. So um, I know that just even just looking up, um, sometimes there's self-care assessments that kind of go through the different um, aspects of wellness. And I know for me, that was helpful because sometimes I thought of self-care as, you know, a face mask and, you know, painting your nails, but it's like sometimes literally just um, saying no to something. Or what I remember one thing I read one time was like wearing clothes that you like versus something else. Um, so that was just something that I found helpful when kind of thinking about self-care in a different way. So. And, and if I can, um, our self-care topic, just something that I feel like I've seen come up recently as well um, with, with some of the folks that I'm working with um, is maybe this idea of moderation in your self-care. Um, and, you know, we want to take care of ourselves, but and times are stressful. If we spend all of our time taking care of ourselves and then neglect our responsibilities because of it, then we've created a, something that is then bigger stress than what we were doing the self-care to take it. And it creates this nasty cycle of, you know, um, of, you know, I'm making what I was trying to cope with worse. And, and then at the same time as well, uh, I've also talked to some folks who are saying I've done my self-care stuff so much that now it does not bring me as much joy. It's not that they've lost interest in it. It's that what used to be my vacation from my stress is now, well, I'm, I do this. This is just part of my daily routine. And, and so watching out and making sure that, you know, we're using that self-care in a healthy way and not a you know, total 100% escape from the things that we still need to get done because then, yeah, we're just going to end up in the same mess we started in. So I wanted to just say, interesting enough, I just downloaded yesterday 30 days of um, self-care. <laughs> so lots of different ideas each day that some things that you don't even think of, you know, buy a candle in your favorite scent, um, take a nap, um, sit in the sun for 10 minutes, you know, um, take a long shower, you know, just even laugh, you know, so it's, it's a good topic. Yeah, I think, I mean, the main thing is just doing something that you enjoy, you know, it could be sitting on the couch and doing nothing, but sometimes you need that, right? And like you said, sitting in the sun today, I encourage everyone to take advantage of the nice weather when you guys are done with school and work and everything, try and get outside. I think it, I mean, it helped my mood yesterday, so it might help you guys too. So uh, the last question I have for um, you guys before we wrap up is um, just how can you help yourself or a friend who is dealing with issues related to stress, depression, or, you know, any other of the mental health themes in this book? Um, I just wanted to say, I think sometimes it's, it seems obvious, but we don't always do it. It's just ask them what would be helpful. Just ask them what, 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 what do they need? And I think sometimes we want to try to fix things and all they need is somebody to listen to them, just to hear them, to be heard. Um, so just those would be my recommendations. I'll add to that. that you know, even for yourself as well, uh, don't be afraid to ask for help. That's something, a theme that I've kind of uh, heard throughout the conversation that we've been having today is that, um, you know, asking for help. Um, I think that's difficult sometimes, but, um, you know, at ICC there, you have uh, some wonderful counselors to uh, help you out if you uh, 
need some help and being able to seek out uh, other community resources that might uh, be beneficial for you. Um, but it's, everyone needs help from time to time, so don't be afraid uh, to reach out for that help. I think um, also along with that, what uh, someone said earlier, I think it was Elizabeth, was communicating with professors. Um, so not being afraid to reach out also beyond just counselors to just like, you know, let people know in your life that, you know, I'm going through a hard time. You can say as little or as much as you want to. Um, but I do think that um, like Elizabeth had said, most times faculty, staff, people are going to be a lot more understanding and work with you if they know a little bit more about what's going on. And it's probably going to take a weight off your shoulder as well um, to be to be able to share that. Yeah, I'm a I'm a huge proponent of that. We used to say that our best weapon was communication. Um, we can't fix what we don't know. And, you know, when we have students come in here and they'll, you know, come into a dean's office, sometimes that's a little, you know, a little scary to some students just because they don't understand what we do. I think they think dean just means like you're going to get in trouble, which that's not what we do at all. But, um, they realize that we're human and we listen to it. And sometimes we're like, oh, I know that happens to me too. And, you know, we work it out with them and we make a plan with them. And, you know, they immediately, you know, see that they've got a cheerleader or a champion, but we wouldn't have known about it if they didn't communicate. And so we can't help or fix what we, you know, what we don't know. Um, and I've got some situations right now where that's exactly what was told to me. I thought if I went to the dean that this would happen. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you're watching too many movies where deans are like, you know, I went to a Catholic school, like nuns had the rulers out and you were getting suspended and stuff. I'm like, no, we're super nice. We try to help and solve problems. Like we're not, you know, mean people, we're trying to fix things. And so... Yeah, I think that communication where they realize like, hey, we're all people and sometimes their story, I'll go, oh my God, that happened when I was in my undergrad. I totally know what you mean. And and they're like, really? I'm like, yeah, it, you know, that that's exactly what happened to me. I'm, I understand. So communication, I mean, you just you just can't beat it. You just it's the best tool in our box, I think. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I've even had, you know, several clients that have either been referred by their teachers or like just told me how just letting them know about what's going on in their life has really, you know, helped them out with getting all their schoolwork done and their professors have been a lot more lenient with stuff like that. And as far as the dean, you know, Amy Daxon Bickler is our new dean of students and she's formal mental health counselor as well. So she's more than understanding about mental health issues if any of that. Uh, the students in the meeting ever need to go to her for help. She, I, I know she'll be understanding, you know, but um, yeah, also if, you know, Tom, you want to plug the counseling center real quick. I was going to say, I'm trying to go intentionally as last as possible to make yeah. sure we can put a nice cap on this conversation. But yeah, I want everyone here, um, especially because, you know, most everyone here is ICC affiliated. So I want everyone to know where students can go for help and counseling services here at ICC. Um, so physical location, we're on the East Peoria campus in the Career Center, so like where most of the general advisors are. Um, that's where you're going to find us. Um, calling that main advising and counseling line, that's 309-694-5281. Um, again, my name is Thomas Payne Brewer. Uh, find me in the directory, absolutely. Um, you, you can send those directly to me or filling out a student of concern form. Um, that that will go to the Dean of Students office and then we will reach out to any students that get contacted uh, or that um, are, are sent to us that way. Um, if you know us, absolutely communicate with us in some way. We'd be happy to reach out to any students. Um, and yeah, if there's any questions, oh, I knew I was reading something. Our website, 
um, go to icc.edu slash counseling. Uh, students can make appointments directly with us through the online scheduler. It's usually the easiest way and it breaks down that first barrier of how do I get an appointment. Um, absolutely great place and if you want more information as well and you can always come and talk to us if you want more information on ICC's counseling services. I do want to add that we do in-person video call and phone sessions as well, especially for some of those that might be at the Peoria campus, can't make it over here, we can do video sessions as well. So yeah, uh, I don't know if the library wants to like wrap things up, but that's all I had for you guys. Thanks for answering my questions. <laughs> I will just go ahead and ask if, if anybody here has any questions for any of the counselors who have um, spoken with us today. So we'll open it up one more time here for that. And Amy, can I address a question that just came through in the chat sure. real quick? Sure. Um, as far as physical location for staff to go for counseling, I do not, there is not a physical location on campus for staff to go, but contact HR. We do have an EAP, um, and I'm sure they would be more than happy to give you more information on the EAP. Amy? Yes, go ahead. It's, it's Kristen. Hey, Kristen. So, they were all talking about all these lovely services, and I don't know if they mentioned that there was no cost to those. So could that be mentioned? Yes. Yes. Entirely free for enrolled students at ICC. Which makes it a an, an very valuable service for all of our students. Well, if nobody else has any other questions or things here, um, I would like to thank our presenters here today. And I appreciate you taking your time out of your busy schedules for this. This has been a great presentation. Um, I learned a lot, learned a whole bunch about signs and signals of depression and what we can do to help ourselves with this. And I really appreciate everybody coming here today. Um, before you go, I have two more things to mention. Number one, I will be sending out later on this afternoon a feedback form on this presentation. I would like to get anything, you know, if you, there's anything you want to tell us about what you learned at the presentation or anything like that. And then I will also plug that our last one book, one college presentation for the year tied to this book is going to be held on Wednesday, April 13th, also at noon. And we will be having Laura Kowalski, the director of the prevention, director of prevention education at Center for Prevention of Abuse. Um, there is another theme in this book of abusive relationships. And so we decided to call them and talk to them about that. We don't have our title yet, but keep an eye out. We will have um, we will have more information forthcoming on that. Again, it'll be a pre-register and it is through Zoom as well. So and with that, I think we can say thank you everybody and again thank you to our presenters i appreciate you taking your time out so much and thank you everybody who came yeah. here today too so thank you so much and thank have a great much. afternoon enjoy that sunshine out there bye bye everyone bye, bye.